From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, and I hear everything production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Shapiro, and today we're going to talk about making software intelligent. Joining us is Peter Voss, who is the founder, CEO, and chief scientist at IGO AI, which is taking technology a step further with the commercialization of the second generation of Peter's conversational AI technology, with a bold mission of providing hyper-intelligent, hyper-personalized assistance for everyone. And today, Peter and I are going to talk about chatbots revolutionizing the enterprise digital assistants. All right, here's the first part of my conversation with Peter Voss, the founder, CEO, and chief scientist at iGo.ai. Peter, welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to have you here. Honestly, I'm really excited to have our conversation about what's happening with artificial intelligence, chatbots. It seems like this is going to be one of the primary hottest points of conversation in the MarTech industry for 2023. We've seen GPT chat, all sorts of open source AI technologies being built and produced and starting to be commercialized, including what you're doing at iGo.ai. Tell me a little bit about what your company is and give me a sense of the landscape of the artificial intelligence technology as it relates to chat these days. I think obviously a lot of excitement now, especially now that ChatGPT has been released and it's quite a phenomenal product in the way it can just have ongoing conversation that seems really natural and has a lot of knowledge. But people also realize very quickly that this technology of big data, deep learning, massive language models just makes up stuff. So I think while on the one hand it's it's very impressive, one also needs to be aware of its limitations and that you cannot really rely on what it's telling you. And I think that's sort of something one has to really separate out what you want to use conversational AI for. So if it's a critical enterprise application where you need to be sure that the system actually conforms to your legal and marketing requirements and so on, this technology is really not adequate. You need something more robust where it's not the quantity of data that trained the system, but rather the quality of the data. And you want something that's scrutable. So there are really these two different approaches to creating conversational AI or chat AI. So talk to me a little bit about what IGO AI is. You've built a conversational AI technology. How is that different than what GPT chat is? There are a number of different ways of looking at this. One of the, I think, quite useful ways is uh, DARPA came out with a report a few years ago where they talk about the three waves of AI. I'll just quickly go through those. The first wave is also called good old-fashioned AI. And that is sort of really what we had in the 70s and 80s, expert systems that are rather logic-based systems using formal logic or different types of logic. A good example of that would be IBM's Deep Blue the world chess champion. So that's a good example of first wave of AI. Then we had a bit of a winter of AI. And then about 10 years ago, the second wave hit us like a tsunami. And that's all about deep learning, machine learning, big data. So that's basically when companies figured out how they could use massive amounts of data that they had and massive amounts of computing power to build models. And we've seen tremendous advances in image recognition, like used for autonomous driving now or semi-autonomous driving. 
speech recognition and targeted advertising, you know, categorizing what somebody's preferences are. So that's really the second wave of AI, and those are statistical systems. So they take massive amounts of data and somehow build a statistical model. And that's very powerful if you're just interested in statistically, it's the most likely kind of categorization, but you don't have to actually be certain. You can't be certain with this with statistical approach. That's a second wave of AI. The third wave of AI are really cognitive systems, things that have reasoning and learning and deep understanding. So that's more the way our minds work, our cognition works, that you really need to have a deeper understanding of what's happening, what the context is, what the other person you, if it's conversational AI, what the other person is trying to achieve. And that is the approach that we started working on about 20 years ago to first do R&D and then to develop uh, technology based on cognitive architectures. What I'm hearing from you is the first wave of artificial intelligence was essentially an if this, then that type infrastructure. The second wave was, I don't know, a really rich calculator, the ability to understand and make some assumptions based on tons of data. And this third wave, we're getting into what I would call an excuse that I'm the only AI joke I could make, the Skynet version of artificial intelligence. Not that AI is going to take over the world and the robots are going to replace us, but it is the notion that the machines are learning and making more judgments, decisions. They're able to ingest and interpret and it seems like actually learn. Am I thinking about the breakdowns of the three waves the right way? I think that is quite a good characterization. And the starting point is what does intelligence entail? What does intelligence require? And some of the things that you expect in an intelligent being is to deeply understand you, to be able to remember what you said five minutes ago or two days ago or two years ago, and to be able to reason about things. You know, if you had a personal assistant that you hired and they didn't remember what you said three minutes ago or three hours ago, they wouldn't last very long. So it's really that approach where the focus is on an accurate representation and understanding and reasoning. So talk to me about some of the applications of artificial intelligence now that essentially machines can learn and reason. How is that being put into enterprise? Is it replacing digital assistance? Talk to me about some of the use cases practically in business. Well, conversational AI is such a key area, of course. Now, applications like Siri and Alexa are not really conversational in sort of in a meaningful way. They tend to be more one-shot type applications where you say something, you know, play Misty for me or tell me the weather or whatever. It's just really one utterance and it then has a categorizer where it says, okay, if you say blah, 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 weather, you probably want to know the weather report. And if you say, I hate Uber, don't ever give me Uber again, it'll probably trigger the Uber app because latched onto the word Uber and it'll ask you, where do you want to go? How many people are going and do you want UberX? So these are the kind of one-shot applications that you have in Siri and Alexa. Call and response, basically. Yeah, exact stimulus response. Mm -hmm. And they basically use second wave technology to categorize what the utterance is, what your intent is, and then use first wave technology, which is basically a flowchart, as you said, the if-then statement. It's basically, if the person gives you an address to go to on Uber, then you need to ask, well, how many people are going and so on. So that is sort of the conventional technology that has been around for some time now and is pretty good at recognizing in intents, but there's really not a conversation going on. Now, if we flip over to customer service, and the easiest way to think about that is call center, contact center, you call into a contact center and you need some kind of help. And that usually entails an ongoing conversation where the agent needs to really understand why you're calling, what the situation is, what you've tried before, and so on, and then guide you through a resolution and hopefully in some efficient way. Now, that entails really an ongoing conversation, a deeper understanding of the context, even a theory of mind. What does the person you're talking to, what does the customer already know? What are they expecting? And so on. And for that, you really need what we call an artificial brain to be able to manage that kind of conversation. 
that's what our focus is on, is to have a very competent and effective conversations to help customers. All right. So if computers can have brains and we're starting to think about their business applications to them, you mentioned chat. There's somebody that comes to my website, a chat window pops up and can answer some basic questions about my products or service. I run a podcast. We've got a sponsorship program. I'd love for people to be able to have a conversation with Ben.ai and to have me not to answer their sponsorship questions. How easy is it to train an algorithm to be able to respond to customers? You know, what are the applications of not only chat, maybe call centers, some sort of a digital assistant? Is it applicable, usable? Is this something that's in market now or we're talking five, 10 years from now? Yes, it's not just text chat. It's, of course, can be a voice interface as well. Really, the common denominator is having an ongoing conversation to address some need that the customer has. Now, how easy it is to train the system to be able to handle it really depends on how much knowledge is required. With our approach, it's not the quantity of training data, but rather the quality of training data. So one way to look at it on on how difficult it is to train the system is to say, if you took somebody off the street with average intelligence who didn't know anything about your business and didn't know anything about business, how long would it take you? What would be involved in teaching them everything they need to know to be able to answer questions, to have a conversation and resolve that? That's kind of a way of looking at it. So if it's a very broad range of knowledge and topics that might be covered, then that can involve quite a bit of effort. But if it's fairly narrow within a domain, for example, technical support for modems or something like that, you could teach the system what it needs to know relatively easily or banking. One of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers, and we give a hyper-personalized concierge-type service to customers where the system remembers who you bought presents for, gifts for. 1-800-Flowers is actually a group of companies, including Harry and David and Popcorn Factory and so on. So it's a gifting company. They do the chocolate-covered strawberries too, right? They do, indeed, yes. Yeah. If you buy those for somebody for their birthday, then... Igo can remember that and possibly remind you or help you find some related product for the next occasion. So it's not boiling the ocean when you're giving that kind of service. You need to know about the products. You need to know about the business rules and different types of occasions that you have. But it doesn't need to know about the weather, about sports, about music, about all sorts of other things that if you were just having a casual chatbot that you might expect the system to know about. Talk to me about the training medium. And by that, I mean, if I wanted to teach somebody about the MarTech podcast, I hear everything sponsorship business because I want them to interact with my leads and sell our sponsorship program. I have to sit down with them or have a Zoom call. Maybe I'm exchanging emails back and forth and giving them the information. When I am training a digital assistant, an AI-driven piece of technology, I'm not sitting in a room and just talking to them. Do you forward emails? Do you scan an inbox? What's the actual way that you get the information to the algorithm? So we're not quite at a stage yet where you can just talk to iGo to teach it everything that it needs to know to do the job. So we have what we call AI psychologists who are basically trained linguists and cognitive psychologists. And they basically go through and understand from you what your business objectives are, what the terminology is that's unique to your application, what business rules apply and so on. And typically the kind of training material that you might have if you had somebody in the call center that needs to start providing the service. So we need to build ontologies, which are basically the terms that are unique to your business to add to the ontology that's already in IGO's brain. So that's kind of the process that we go to. Typically, it also involves hooking up to some APIs, to some databases, so that you can get up-to-the-minute information and also update the database with whatever you've gathered during the conversation. So there's basically API integration, ontology development, capturing the business rules that are involved, and then the kind of conversation that you typically want to have with your customer. How much do you find customers are aware that they are not talking or interacting with a person? Is it something that's clear when they go to 800 Flowers, for example, that it's a bot that they're communicating with as opposed to an actual live heart beating human? 
It's an interesting question. We often have customers ask us to set up the bot in a way that it sounds as human as possible and that people can't tell the difference. Now, I'm personally, from a practical and from a philosophical point of view, opposed to that approach. I believe you should always be upfront that it's a bot, that it's an artificial being, A, for just to be upfront and be honest about that. But also people will behave differently. They're not going to start talking about the weather or about the new pet that they just got. So it makes for a more honest and efficient conversation, really, to be upfront that it's an intelligent chatbot. Talk to me a little bit about cost. You mentioned large companies. 800 Flowers is a giant conglomerate, a wonderful gift-giving company. They're also huge. Lots of money and can afford deep AI integrations. Is this technology accessible down market? What does it cost? What goes into actually training and implementing a digital bot program? At the moment, the tools that we have to teach the system and to develop are still being improved. So the cost of implementation keeps going down as time goes on. Just as a rough guideline, the system doesn't cost anything. It saves you money. That's the starting point. That's a great answer. But tell me what it costs. <laughs> it costs you minus 80% of your current cost, basically. But the implementations can be anywhere from 20,000 to half a million, if I have to give a range, to implement it. Typically, we find that right now with the development of the technology and the tools that we have and the sort of libraries we have, any call center of, say, 50 people or more could definitely have a spectacular ROI. If you have like three people in an office taking phone calls, answering it, we probably couldn't make the numbers work. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is it's tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, primarily focused at replacing the call center expenses. And once you get to a critical mass, double digit call center representatives, then it might make sense to start thinking about replacing some of the personal headcount with this chatbot type technology. Correct. But every month, every year, we reduce the cost of implementation as the core brain that we start with has more and more capabilities and the tools that we have to implement are becoming more powerful. So we do expect over time to be able to offer this to medium-sized and even one-man show companies. So in the coming years, we'll definitely be able to make that happen. It is a brand new world out there. And for those listening who have large call centers, using artificial intelligence to lower your cost might actually be more efficient and provide a better experience. But for us one-man shows, I don't think I'm going to be having a Ben bot anytime soon. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Peter Voss, the founder, CEO, and chief scientist at IGO AI. Join us again tomorrow when Peter and I continue our conversation talking about hyper-personalization in customer service. If you can't wait until our next episode and you'd like to learn more about Peter, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can contact him on Twitter where his handle is Peter E. Voss, that's P-E-T-E-R-E-V-O-S-S. -E -E or you can visit his company's website, which is igo.ai, A-I-G-O dot A-I. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can even send us your topic suggestions or your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is martechpod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly. My handle is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.